Thank you very much, Phil. I, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, uh, spearhead this uh, along with uh, the other individuals that you've identified uh, and your member partners. Uh, this is uh, certainly a topic that is uh, near and dear to the hearts of every single one of us uh, in this room on this call and uh, from coast to coast to coast, I know that. Uh, if that would have been anything less than that, we wouldn't need to do this. So uh, I want to first of all uh, thank each and every one of you for taking the time and making the effort to be a part of this. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't suggest strongly that uh, the OHF and the member partners uh, are very much vested uh, stakeholders in all of this, as is uh, Hockey Canada. So thanks for giving me the time. Um, the concerns I have is that you, as the as the leading MHAs, um, you know, have, have have not recognized the virtues of IP and cross ice hockey uh, to the point where um, you know we, we we could have maybe avoided tonight. Um, had we been better informed, possibly, uh, recognize the value of it, maybe, um, but had the courage to step up and implement it more than anything else. Um, that, that's not a slight on anyone. I think that suggests to all of us uh, that communication needed to be enhanced. Uh, certainly the opportunity to deliver uh, to parents, coaches, administrators, and the MHAs uh, could possibly have been enhanced. But somewhere along the line, there's a lack of synapse with respect to what has been uh, identified as a mandate from Hockey Canada, um, certainly endorsed by our board, and the member partners across the country, and, and where we stand tonight. Um, I'm concerned that there has been a, a failure to take that leap of faith, quite honestly, folks, uh, to a program and hockey dynamic that, uh, to me, uh, is most important, most critical uh, to the development of our, of our citizenship through kids, um, and it is one of those programs that is worldwide um, in terms of its recognition, to say the least. Is it just that cross-ice hockey does not serve the purpose of your children uh, because they're just simply too advanced and, and, and it, it presents a bigger challenge? Uh, you know, as I look back, I mentioned earlier of having witnessed this program uh, 35 years ago and, and having um, traveled the province of British Columbia talking about the virtues of the IP and, and small space and cross ice games, I, it brings me back to a point that I, I don't want to miss, but I don't want you to misunderstand either. Uh, this is not about getting as many kids to the National Hockey League. This is not about getting kids to uh, NCAA schools or the CHL and that scholarship, whatever the, the case may be. We are in, um, if you want to frame it in such that it's corporate Canada, we are in the experience industry. And, and the bottom line is that the experience is controlled, the environment is controlled, and the environment is enhanced uh, by adults. And every single time a child comes to the rink, it should be something extraordinary. And I wonder about 200 by 85, and, and wonder who it's extraordinary for there. Uh, in the early uh, mid 80s, uh, there were Scott, Nick Scott Niedermeyer and Rob Niedermeyer in, in Cranbrook, BC, my hometown. The pilot project of the day was the IP. And it's not a surprise to me that you know both those guys are Stanley Cup winners. One of them is in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And this is no measure uh, by which we look at the success of the IP, other than to suggest they learned the, the, the basic fundamental skills of the game through the IP. But what is really interesting to me, um, if in fact we have to equate the success of this program with the trajectory of a player to the National Hockey League, heaven forbid. But in nine consecutive years, from that same age, uh, age category as Rob and Scott, Stanley Cup made its way to Cranbrook nine years in a row. And that was not because of 200 by 85. Um, it was because of cross-ice small space hockey. It was because of the ability of coaches to take on the leadership position and associations to take on the leadership position and in this case, Cranbrook, to step outside the comfort zone and recognize that what they were doing was investing as little, in little people to play the game for a lifetime in whatever manner that might look. The fact of the matter is, these guys did work very, very well. The fact of the matter is, too, that thousands of others did as well and did not come close to the National Hockey League. Your fundamental role as, a, as minor hockey associations as administrators, as coaches, as parents, um, is to equip the participant with the physical and mental skills um, so as to have the time of their lives for a lifetime. 
Small space hockey delivers on both. Um, I look at I look at falling down and getting up. I look at having to skate backwards. I look at having to kick the puck to your stick with great path. I look at the setbacks and challenges that small, small space hockey provides. Um, I look at learning judgment and conceptual hockey. A couple of things that aren't identified, quite honestly, when we talk about cross-ice hockey. We talk about skill enhancement, those types of things, and we should. But I thought I, I look at problem solving, I look at the, the conceptual need to, to develop a hockey sense, I, I look at learning judgment, um, and these, these are things that aren't necessarily talked about when it comes to small ice hockey. Um, you know, so, so that's something to consider as well, the concept of support, puck possession, um, numerical advantage, and, and, and creativity, the number one most difficult thing to defend in any player um, is creativity, and I'm not sure that that can exist with the level of frequency that 200 by 85 invites. There is a time and place for that, no question. Um, I'm not sure that's for the five and six year old, to be honest with you. And, and if we're not careful, we're going to push five and six year olds out of the game because it's been hot housed and they've had to drink the game from a fire post as opposed to identifying with the skills, both cognitive, physiological, and emotional skills to, to, play, the, to play the game. So, what I would suggest to you is that the the game is not an endurance test. It is about frequency over duration. It is about puck touches, balance and agility, spatial awareness, and finding creative ways to overcome various challenges. I, I'm not sure that 200 by 85 really provides that for this age group. Um, it's become clear to me that hockey in Canada requires an element of quality control, um, ongoing education, perpetual education uh, of parents, uh, whereby the people in this room, and myself included, have a responsibility to make sure that they understand the values of IP, that they understand the values of cross-ice hockey. As we push five and six-year-olds into the game, push five and six-year-olds into the game, they should want to come to the ring. They should want to be involved in skill development. They should be involved with the enhancement of their ability to read and react and judge the situation and make decisions with frequency. Not duration, um, and I and I believe that all of us own that. Um, so in, in my mind, uh, we need to get together quickly to define what fun, what involvement, what self confidence can look like through our shared commitment to the growth of our kids, through the shared commitment to the initiation program, to the shared commitment to cross ice hockey. If we can do that, we won't be talking about. Uh, you know, children leaving the game at 13 or 14 years of age because they've had too much, they didn't measure up to certain expectations, the game isn't fun anymore. We will be talking about kids that are actually playing the game for a lifetime, not anywhere near the National Hockey League, but making it a lifetime sport because they've been equipped with those cognitive skills, with the emotional balance that it takes to participate in the activity in our, in our country in general, and of course, necessary physical skills to play the game however we wish. And we can't walk alone by that. And we have to take responsibility and recognize our role in this. Again, whether you're an administrator, a coach, uh, whatever the case may be, we have to understand, are we actually improving the situation? Are we, are, are, are we an impediment because we're satisfied with where things are, we're afraid of change, or we think that we've got the answer as it is? This has been mandated across the country for a reason. I support it completely. I support the OHF, I support the member associations. I support every minor hockey association in Canada who chooses to have the courage to implement this program and to the degree that I possibly can. I will come and see you too. And we can talk about this, and we can talk about the virtues of cross-ice hockey as it means to me as much as any other aspect of the game we coach. And so with that, Phil, I, again, I want to thank you for for setting this up. I do want to thank all of you that are in the room for making the effort. I beg your indulgence as I ramp on here, but this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I hope you felt it, that. At the same time, there's rational involved, and I know that Steve and Corey will deliver on all of that as well. So, so thank you for your time. Uh, carry on. Have a great evening. Ask questions. Learn. Evolve. And have the courage to take that step. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tom, for taking the time out of your day. Uh, I know you wish you could have been here, but uh, that uh, wasn't possible with the travel schedules. Uh, we're going to uh, now go into having uh, 
uh, Dr. Steve Norris provide uh, some information on the uh, physiology of youth and the physiology of the, the human. So, And uh, for some ground rules in, in how we approach this, uh, what we will do is after Steve's presentation, we will take some questions uh, specific to his content and, and going through that. And then we'll go into Corey's presentation, uh, do uh, questions regards to his content, and then we'll have some general question time at the end where uh, the uh, myself, uh, Scott, Don, and uh, Ian, and uh, Corey, and, and uh, Dr. Steve Norris will be available to answer questions in uh, general terms as well. So over to you, Steve. <laughs> First off, uh, one thing I'd like to say is dismiss with the fact that I have a weird accent, um, which I realize may come as a shock when you talk about but I have lived here since 1990. Um, I came to go to U of A, did my PhD on the road. Don't worry about that, it's after the name, so we want to stand off the West End for. And this is more of the same, the PhD just stands for part of the So, don't worry about that. Steve, I see myself very much as a resource for the entire hockey community, no matter who you are and whatever age group. Ruthless with you in that my major task, my major task is actually And when we start dealing with four, five, six, seven, eight, Hand in hand with that, if we were actually the stakeholders and board of directors of a major corporation, our market share, as measured, let's say, by the, as an indicator, the top level of hockey that we see, the NHL, has gone from over 98% to this year, for the first time, we did below 51%. We're basically 25 years. This is disgraceful. If we, were the, if we were the board of directors of PepsiCo, we would all be fired, the entire community. So let's not pretend that development of youngsters is not linked to high performance. It absolutely is. There is no, no demarcation between these components. Now, on the other side of that, I'm interested in every child because life itself is an athletic event. It will up here 70 to 80 years on the planet, largely aerobic, with a bit of lifting and a few sprints thrown in for fun. That's life. What I find tragic is how few people, youngsters, are playing the game at the end of high school, at least in any type of organized fashion. That is a sad indictment. And I remind all of us in this room, you don't really want to be a child's last age group coach, do you? What a sad indictment that is. So I'm here as a resource. I can't talk to you about timelines and communication. I'm just going to give you the bare facts. Humans haven't changed in their development in thousands of years. And it's just sad that our major sport has been so slow in educating everyone. Why does school understand this? Colleges. Why does, unfortunately, all the guys at the top level in the NHL, they get it. They understand it. It's unfortunate that in the old NCCP program, it wasn't until you got to level four and five, AKA the national team, the Olympic team coaches, that you actually taught anything to do with child and youth development. Kind of stupid, really, when they're dealing with the 23 to 25 year olds. We should have made sure that we had all this information in the, at the fingertips of the parents to understand. And certainly of our age group coaches, the most important the most difficult role in anything to do with the athlete continuum, athlete for life or athlete for performance, is age group coaching. It's the most difficult role. You've got to be everything. You've got to have a little bit of understanding of most things. You've got to know where to go to to get the resources that you require. And all around us, the rest of the world is marching on. The Americans handing us our ass over this last decade. California, 8,000 registered players outperforming the whole of the New England states as measured by the draft of the NHL over the last five to six years. The warm weather 
NHL teams and states and what they're doing. It's amazing if you look, you look to see what Dallas is doing in the community with its seven satellite programs, what Chris Pronger and Keith Kachuk are doing in St. Louis, Anaheim, Los Angeles. And what are we doing here? And we get wrapped up in the emotion all the time. I applaud that, that's part of our strength. But we've narrowed our pyramid because we've watched our participation rates so that now, at 17 years of age, our pool of so-called talent, so-called talent, is as narrow as Sweden and Finland. And yet we start out with tens upon tens of thousands of magnitude of more players than them. And if you really want to win at the highest level, and remember I'm doing this because I want to make sure you understand the entire continuum of any kid who lives and dreams around hockey. To understand that at the high, this highest level of the game, there are three things that dictate international success. Across any sport, any gender. Population size, money and resources invested in the system, and the social, cultural, political significance of sport in that society. There are only two countries in the world that currently have all of that across all their athletic levels. The United States of America and China being chased hard by a third country, India. Thank God they've got so many difficult aspects in terms of poverty and education that they're a long way from becoming a serious power at the moment, at least in most sports. But in pockets, you can have all three, and in Canada, we have all three when it comes to hockey. Social, cultural, political significance of sport. It's probably the only sport in the country where a politician, including the Premier or the Prime Minister, will actually talk about the sport regularly. We have a large population base that starts out on the journey, a journey that very few will finish, even though I believe hockey is a game for life. The vast majority of people that play hockey in this country have nothing to do with minor hockey associations. All those adult beer leagues. And then, of course, the money and resources we put into it. The number of ice rinks certainly must, I don't know, be an order of magnitude well in advance of any swimming pools we've got in the country. We put tens upon tens. I shudder to think how many millions upon millions of dollars we put into this sport, whether it's directly in or out of your pockets. And that's not necessarily to do with the ice or to do with um, additional training, but that's to do with tournaments and, and hotel nights and travel and all those type of things. But I'm going to start off before I show you some slides, and you can have anything I show you. It's always referenced. It's all old as well, most of it, because we haven't changed. I'll show you all the growth curves. I'll show you why kids up until about the age of 12 are quite dramatically different than they will be between 13 to 16. I'll show you why even that age group is very different to 18 to 21. And I'll show you when the stable, mature platform finally evolves, including where the brain actually stabilizes out, which is actually one of the most late occurring components. All of those of you who got late teenagers will understand that aspect. Let me just uh, show you a couple of things to get the, get the ball rolling, so to speak. Okay, giving you a bit of background, we're going to talk about information, we're going to talk about competition. Don't let anyone, anyone, ever tell you that competition is not important. It absolutely is. If we didn't impose it as adults, the children would invent it themselves anyway. They do in every game they play, everything they invent, even if it's climbing a tree, they invent a game around it. They may not necessarily always worry about a world championship of tree climbing, but they have some level of competition in it. I want you to have an open mind about the data, okay? Corey's gonna show you a load of stuff that I hope will help you. I just remind you, we as a, uh, me just as a, as a, I guess a, a Joe Blow that helps the national governing body, Hockey Canada, I definitely want to reiterate that I am here as a resource for you. I'm here to challenge you because one of the disadvantages you have as both sometimes a coach, but certainly as a parent, is that emotional tie. It's quite difficult to distance yourself from your children at times. You want the best. I've met very few parents that really want to screw their kids up. There's the odd one or two. 
Okay? But most people are trying to do the best possible thing. The only issue is no one teaches you anything to do typically with growth and maturation 101 or 202 or 303. So unless you've done some kind of true academic work in either the medical sciences or in kinesiology or any of those particular endeavors, you're not party to the information. And we, as a community, have done a terrible job of sharing this information and allowed our competitors to come right past us. Sickening. And the worst thing for us is that for me as an Englishman, as I, well, Canadian now, but as an Englishman, as I look at the English Premiership League, the NHL, if we talk about that as being our league of where it had its roots, it's English soccer 50 years ago, where our league became populated by foreigners. I'm going to sound like Don Cherry any second here. But I will. There's a danger to that. You have to understand how to use foreigners to uplift our program, not allow them to overrun it. So now we don't have many English players playing routinely on a Wednesday or a Saturday or a Sunday, or even occasionally on a Monday. In our league, they're foreigners, high priced. And yet if I were to turn around to you, if you want to compete at the World Cup of Soccer, the statistics, if you read any of the money ball around the game of soccer, you need 50 world-class players, 50, to make the squad of 26 to 27, 50. So if you haven't got anyone playing in the top flight, where do you find your 50? Well, those English guys are playing in the Championship League, the next league down, and the league down too. All the foreigners are playing in our league. So be careful what you wish for, the unintended consequences. And of course, if you start to select very, very early, here's the other damning statistic across all sports, both genders. 86 to 97, sorry, 85 to 96% of the age group champions are not the people that win at the senior level. I don't give a damn who wins even at 10, 12, 14, 16 years of age, outside of perhaps female artistic sports. No such thing as a 10-year-old champion, 12-year-old champion. It's us parents. We are actually the world champions of comparison. It's us. That's what we do. So this is the journey we're going to talk about. I'm going to actually go from about here through to about here, and we're going to come back and talk about this age group, because this is extremely important. They're very plastic, very malleable, very open to change. They watch us like hawks. Remember, the most powerful way children learn is through mimicry, copying. So if you're going to teach a child something, you better be able to demonstrate damn well. That's a challenge. Because most of us, if we're really honest, any idiot, any idiot could administer a league. I could bring my mum in. She's going to be 85 next week. She understands what goes on with hockey. If I gave her the basic, here's how much uh, ice time we have, here's how many teams, she could sit down and come up with a league. That tells you nothing about the technical competency of what the children are being exposed to or the major thing we actually control, which is the quality of the environment. And it's that environment that brings them back, not only week after week, but year after year. And remember, because you are students of sport, you've all read probably the last three major studies on team sports across North America, so you understand what the kids, all the way from initiation to major junior, say about sport, which of course is this. The number one reason for staying in sport, according to the children and youth, having fun. The number one reason for leaving sport, not having fun. And remember, this is someone saying this to you, me, where my job description says this, how I measured. World Championship, Olympic, and World Cup medals, end of story. And yet I'm telling you that it's important to treat every kid with quality, to understand the process all the way through, and they are not miniature adults. I'm going to show you all this stuff very clearly. As I said, you can have it. So we're going to talk about childhood, adolescence into young adulthood, and then finally into adulthood. It is clearly a complex process. Okay, even though I, my schooling is in physiology, I don't talk about physiology much these days. I talk about the entire milieu of performance. So I go out and get the experts in psych or biomechanics or whatever it might be, or coaching mechanics. It doesn't really matter. I want you to understand the dashboard concept. What is on the dashboard for the six-year-old for this season? 
for the seven-year-old, for the eight-year-old, for the nine-year-old. Don't even start about dealing with two-year age bands. I'll show you why that is something that we seriously have to address in the future. Really. So here's the first graph. Sorry, School 101. 1930, okay? 1930 it first appears by Scammon. You've got a percentage scale where 100% is the final adult state. Along the bottom, roughly the first two decades of life. Okay? First line, neural development, aka the internet of the body, aka brain height, sorry, brain weight, brain size. So you can see immediately in the first decade, massive change in the size of the brain. And all of you know this. You know little babies and toddlers and infants have bigger heads in proportion to their bodies than we as adults. We gradually have the rest of the body grow into the size. Why? Because the brain is responding to all the stimuli that's coming at the child. Height, uh, sorry, light, pressure sensitivity, heat, cold, sound, all these type of things. And it's literally stimulating the sensory components of the brain to actually grow, quite literally. The biochemistry is causing these proteins to lay down much greater capacity of the brain. And just like the energy systems, we have a capacity and a power. So in the first sort of decade and a half, we build capacity of the brain. That alone should scream at you that you expose children to as many different stimuli as possible. Why do you think you go to school? And you don't just do language arts for the next 18 years. You do a whole wide range of subjects, and you do the core ones, the literacy ones, English, or well, language, reading, writing, arithmetic, because that opens the door to everything else. In the same way around a physical literacy, run, jump, throw, kick, strike, catch, understand pressure sensitivity, learn to skate, learn to swim. Because one day you're going to have to solve a challenge, perhaps in the game of hockey, where you have to thread the needle of not only of yourself, but also of the puck eventually, and you have to solve that problem. And it's not going to come at you from a narrow way of simply having skated the game. I'm fed up every April of NHL teams phoning me up and saying, Steve, I've got a 23-year-old defenseman, got to send him to you to learn how to skate backwards. To which the simple answer is, not a hope. Not unless you're going to give him to us for several months. Oh, but he's a professional athlete, so you've only got 10 weeks in the summer. So that's not going to happen. So what we can do, we can put him in bed for a couple of weeks, get rid of all the fatigue from the season. So as soon as you put him on ice, he looks immediately better because he's got rid of all the fatigue. You can put him in a strength training program. So again, when he's well rested and not under pressure, either from a space and time point of view by people pressurizing him, he looks as though he can skate backwards. But as soon as he gets fatigued, or you put him under pressure again, he will revert back to the motor patterns he learnt prior to the age of 12. The other thing is, we allow our players to advance simply because they're a year older, not because they're any better, a year older. So you'll see even at the NHL level, particularly the average journeyman player, they actually can't work cognitively doing complex tasks at the same time, chewing gum or whatever it might be. But in the instance of hockey, this, a gross motor skill compared to a fine motor skill. So you watch very carefully the number of guys that really can't turn in both directions that well. They can classically protect the puck to the inside of the blade, no matter what handed they are, right? They can't turn that well to the outside because they were, they never, they were always doing what they felt they were already good at, classic. The next thing, of course, is they often have to go to the glide to make the shot or the pass. In other words, they can't skate at full speed, a gross motor task, and perform a fine motor skirt task with the upper body. These are all learnable things. But of course, no one had the patience to do that when they were younger. And whilst it's true, with all most recent brain research over the last decade, that you can definitely teach an old dog new tricks, the higher and higher you get in the game, the less time unless you're really dedicated, like a few of the superstars, the outliers, to truly put the practice in with the direction that's required. It all starts young, very young. Quality environment, great coaching. It's always about people, programs, 
and don't worry about the places. We could go out into the quadrangle just out here where that living wall is. I could teach you absolutely everything to do with the tactics of hockey. We could put with some hockey tape down, we could sort of ghost out what the ice lines look like and I could teach you absolutely everything just with a tennis ball. You don't even have to have a stick, you just kick it around. I'll teach you everything to do with tactics. Don't even need the ice. There's a lesson for you. Preserve your precious ice time and do stuff away from the ice. I could even do lots of technical work with you. Soft hands, pressure sensitivity. Could do pressure sensitivity on the inside or the outside of the foot. These are all great skills if you want to skate. Don't even need the ice for that, so that when you get to the ice, they already know what to do. But do you think like that? Or do you need a multi-million dollar facility that you're play, paying a lot of money for? I always want to put another clock on the wall of ice arenas. For every time I see a group sitting down and standing around talking, and I'm going to start that clock only instead of time, it's dollar signs. Oh, there they went, 50 bucks. We hadn't even said anything to them, I just called them over to me. You understand what I'm saying to you? Use that precious time. Because the key element and phrase I want you to understand is this. If you're teaching children and youth, time on task. Time on task has to be your metric. How many times is that puck on the blade? This is the challenge if you really have pathetic practice to game ratios. Because games are very, very, they're fun and they need to be there. But what do they have to look like? but they're not a very good use of time for the child who is developing. Because even with just two lines, they're sitting on the bench 50% of the time. So you turn up for an hour, 30 minutes sitting on the bench. If you are running a business of skill acquisition, that is awful. You throw away 50% of the time. Go to more lines than that, even less time. Now you're down to, in a game situation, maybe a kid on the ice, for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Maybe. And then how many few seconds is the puck on the blade? Even less. So really think about these. You're students of the sport. We've just got to help you. So this is neural development. Notice how it plateaus out. That doesn't mean to say brain development is over. What it's now doing, the brain is really learning how to use that capacity beforehand. Up until about the age of 12, 13, 14, a child isn't that good at dealing with a new situation armed on previous experience. That's something that they gradually develop. That's why sometimes any of you are teaching five and six year olds, I've taught quite a lot of swimming and sailing and squash and stuff like that in my lifetime. And you know, you have them come once a week, let's say, in a swimming lesson. So they come in for the first week, you put them in the pool, they come back the next week, they can't even remember who you are, let alone what they did last week. It's just the way kids are until they get a little bit older because they're not us, they're not adults. Compared to this line, now this is the line that often most people get really hopped up when dealing with new sport. This is really the development, particularly of the signaling of the hormonal system, the endocrine system. And in this case, this is a rough representation of the circulating levels of the male sex hormone testosterone present in both males and females. Now this is a very, very important upstream signaling mechanism because this is the one that drives things to do with the onset of the secondary character, sexual characteristics, the deepening of the voice in the males, and particularly hypertrophy, increase in muscle mass. Little point in worrying about doing massive forms of weight training and all that type of stuff that the Olympic group and the senior players do until this upsweep occurs. Because you need that before you can lay down loads of muscle. Does this mean, and don't immediately think, oh, Steve Norris said don't do dry land training. No, it's what dry land training might look like. Lots of games, lots of uh, gymnastic type things. You ever seen like a six or seven year old female gymnasts? They can climb a rope like that without even using their legs. So pretty strong, right, in the upper body? Yeah? How are they doing that? Well, remember this curve, the, the move one? It's because they're learning how to use their body because of the brain development. And of course, there is a natural overload as they start to grow. So the overall muscle mass is going up because they're a little bit taller than they used to be. And they don't have that much fat mass if they're active, so their powder weight ratio is pretty high. So understand what's going on 
in humans, which means the overall growth curve over the first two decades of life is somewhat sigmoidal. There's quite a lot of stuff happens in the first few years, a period of relative stability, and then all hell breaks loose when they start to go through puberty until the end of the teen and early 20s. Very, very important you understand that, which means you can almost divide this into two broad categories. Here, as I said, do lots and lots of stuff, teach lots of skill, make sure you've got really good quality instructors, use competition to up the ante, you know, put them under pressure, it's no different than school. And here's the thing, you know, it's kind of interesting what we do with a lot of team sports. Things that we would never do in school, for example, who kind of get it when it comes to education, right? You imagine, if I signed up to do history this semester, and I turned up in the first week, and I was given an exam on history. And if I passed or failed that exam, that determined what happens next. So if I fail the exam, I can't do history now. Doesn't happen in school, though, does it? What's that like? Well, that's like kind of doing tryouts. We're going to do tryouts in hockey before we've even taught you anything. You've just gone through the whole of the summer, the biggest growth and development period of the year, particularly for us Canadians, because, of course, one of the primary driving forces for growth over those first two decades of life is to do with the sun. The sun. The driver of life on the planet. Compared to this period, now this is when the real serious, if you like, physical training takes place. This is really where you can really get after the brain and start to teach really more complex tactics. I always get very worried in sports because we expose children to only a few coaches over their lifespan. And we wonder why some players can't adapt to new systems. It's because they've been drilled into the ground. They play one sort of way. And we will get frightened of having other coaches coming, even guest coaches coming in, and of showing out and challenging our children and youth to play differently. Because we're training the brain as much as we are anything else. And we don't want them to play like robots. We want them to be totally capable of playing any system they're asked. Who dictates that? The people running the program. Forget about the place. This one. This line is actually height change over the course of the year. So everything on this graph that I'm going to show you is improving. It's just the rate of change. The top of the arrow is about 12 to 15 centimeters a year. Um, the middle part's about five, six centimeters a year. And down the bottom is about one centimeter a year. Again, first two decades of life. Here's North American girls, OK? You didn't need me to tell you that there's quite a lot of growth in the first couple of years. A little baby comes out of the womb, two years of age. You've got this little human standing next to you. Then there's a period of relative stability of growth. And then they hit this period here. OK? They hit, they hit this point right there. OK? The onset of the pubertal growth spurt, which comes up to a peak in North American girls at about plus about 12 to 13 years of age, plus or minus a year, they're growing at their fastest rate on average. And then it gradually slows down until they reach their peak height. Okay, you know that. Didn't need me to tell you that. Compared to North American boys, and you didn't need me to tell you that, North American boys grow slightly later on average than the girls. They also end up being, on average, taller than the girls. Why? Because they grow for a little longer, and they have a much more accelerated growth profile. Okay, it means when they start growing, they grow faster and further. So you didn't need me to tell you that. You knew all that, right? Yes, just observational. Clear, you're students of this process. The only other thing is these dotted lines, and this is a challenge for all of us, these dotted lines now refer to the laying down of bone mineral density. So the kids have grown very rapidly tall-wise first, right? And long bones are responsible for the change in height, okay? Long bones being the bones of the lower extremities as well as the upper extremities. But of course, they don't grow in, in unison. One minute they look like orangutans, right, with long arms. The next minute they're all legs and then they're orangutans again for a while until finally they steady out and you have their proportions. But the bones have grown lengthwise. And as you come over the top of the peaks, 
the end, if I ripped a femur out of like a 14-year-old boy, which is roughly where the peak is for the boys in North America, roughly speaking, you would see the growth plates start to close around each end, okay? Each end. Once that happens, that bone no longer grows in length anymore. So you start to see the slowing of the, of the height change, right? And now, the reason for the major height change is to do with the myriad of bones of the spine. But of course, the third lumbar spine isn't gonna grow several centimeters, it's just a few millimeters. But there's lots of these little bones, so the height continues to change until eventually no more height change because the bones have now matured. The problem is, in those long bones, as you come over the peak, is that, you know a crunchy bar? You know a chocolate crunchy bar with a honeycomb? Well, imagine that crunchy, that crunchy bar with no honeycomb. It's just the chocolate around the outside. So it's kind of fragile, right? That is the femur of the 14-year-old boy. If we were to rip it out of him, saw through it with a chainsaw, peer inside and look at the trabecular bone, which is that honeycomb stuff, it's not that well developed yet. Which is, of course, in these big growth spurts, this is why children are in fracture windows. Fracture windows. They're set up for that. This is why the American College of Pediatrics, the Canadian Academy of Sport Medicine, go after sports that allow massive physical contact in and around these age groups, because we're setting them up for skeletal failure. Food for thought. I don't have a problem with it, because I think they should be climbing trees and falling over and crashing out and breaking your bone anyway, okay? Just life, it happens. It's a part of, it's almost a rite of passage. But understand what is going on here. Because what you want to do is influence those dotted lines as much as possible. So what causes the development of that really strong trabecular bone? All of you might say, oh, calcium, we've got to drink a load of milk bunch of yogurt, whatever it might be. Absolutely, good diet. But the major driving forces are loading forces. Loading forces. This is why through that age group, those of you running off-ice programs, particularly through here, you wanna make sure you're doing a multitude of activities. Because if you're just running, the loading forces are just running. Not doing too much for the upper body, are we? If you just swim, you're in a weight-supported sport, so ironically, You've, although there is some kind of power on the upper body and the, uh, the upper extremities, the real loading forces come when you dive into the pool, lower body, and when you do a flip turn and push off the wall, lower body. Kind of ironic, isn't it? So you want to do as many different things, including the upper body, okay, to develop a strong skeletal system. Because here's the important health message for us Canadians with massively rising health costs. Instead of r drawing a line looking at peak bone, uh, sorry, the change in bone mineral density, if I change that graph to show um, bone mineral density absolute, you would see, sorry, you would see this. It would start here, gradually improve through the first decade of life. And interesting enough, we used to think it peaked out here in the late third decade of life, but now we know it's somewhere between the end of the second decade of life, the teens, and the early part of the third decade, early 20s, you get a bit of a honeymoon period through the 20s, and then gradually there is a decline until death. And out there, 60 years later, is the ogre of hip fracture and things like that. So one of the things we want to do, of course, in every one of our kids, is to drive bone mineral density as high as we can in that first and second decade. Interesting, huh? All starts young if you do the right stuff. If you do the right stuff, you're patient and you understand the process. You can see this period through here, very important period for what we're talking about, from what I understand. We're all interested in six-year-olds in this particular room at the moment. Six-year-olds. This is a relative period of stability in terms of growth. But it's not consistent. I warned you about the summers, particularly in Ontario, where perhaps you have relatively dull winters, so not always a lot of sunlight. So the summers are very important for growth. So you might see that November, December, January, not a lot of change in height, okay? And you get more accelerated height when the sun comes back. But in general, it's not this. So if I'm gonna say a kid's gonna grow six centimeters over the next calendar year, it's not like half a centimeter in January, half a centimeter in, 
in uh, February and so forth, so forth. There'll be fits and spurts depending on the environment. Okay? But the key thing is, it's not a lot of change. Not a lot of change. So this is a very important period for, remember the brain development that's occurring? That's going on behind this? To do lots and lots of exposure to different things, teach lots and lots of basic skills, understand the progressions. They're not all going to progress at the same rate. You've all watched beginner hockey, kid that picks up hockey, uh, skating quickly, Sonny's dominating the game for a few years until everyone else catches up. It just happens that way. But do not lose that window. <coughs> Rhythm. How many of you even involve music in your practices or allow music to occur? Rhythm is inherent. And remember, it's such a brain component in all sport. The rhythm of the glove safe, the rhythm of skating, the rhythm of the flat shot. Rhythm is inherent in every facet of movement. And children are going through the fact that you can teach and expose them to this as well as things that happen naturally. So I talked about the kids learning to control themselves, uh, uh, to um, move themselves, the kids in gymnastics, for example. Okay, but one of the most complex motor skills, believe it or not, is this one. Skipping, which we take for granted. But you won't see a five-year-old skip. Not on average. Certainly won't see a four-year-old skip. They're having enough trouble walking. And when you put them on ice and skating, you know what you see. The key issue is there's a number of things happening. There's this natural evolution component, the underlying genetic matrix, which is governing some movement com components. The reason why skipping is so difficult is it's a very highly synchronized, syncopated movement. You've got to be able to move and do other things before you can do that one. So it comes relatively late in the sequence. These are known as periods of sensitivity. And why I'm telling you they're important is that if you rush after adult, watered down adult forms of training with little kids and don't understand you're coming this way and building forward, you will miss opportunities. Here's a classic. Here we are in a bilingual country, okay? There's a very, very finite window when it comes to languages. Now, it's true that some of us, some of us are able to learn a second language as an adult, but for many of us, it's quite difficult. Up until about the age of six or seven, quite easy for children to learn a second language. But there is a significant difference about learning a language before the age of six compared to learning it as an adult. A child learning a second language before the age of six can learn it accent-free of their mother tongue. That's a classic window of sensitivity. You want to know another one, even earlier than that? A baby born with cataracts. So I warned you about the neural development. So you have now have a physical block against the optic nerve, which would otherwise be expecting to get some kind of light signal coming down to the developing sensory components of the brain to do with sight. But if that doesn't happen, then the growth-like factors don't actually develop. Those sight sensory comp components don't develop. So even if the pediatrician picks it up at age two or whatever, removes the cataract, the baby's still blind. These are periods of sensitivity. Rhythm, probably before the age of eight. So what do your dance programs look like? What does music look like? How do you incorporate that into some of your skating drills or even in your goaltending, although the age of eight is, hopefully you're doing that with all the players. Pressure sensitivity I mentioned. This is why, again, you want to get them in the gym and doing stuff in bare feet so they can understand the nuances of balance weight transfer, it's all very important for where you want to skate. You can start to see it's a complex process, isn't it? Everyone needs help. Not everyone's an expert in every area. I'm certainly not. I know where I've got to go and ask for help. And I'm not too proud to do it. What about you? Know what you know, know what you don't know, and know someone that does know if you don't. Very simple. Compared to this period, can you imagine, look at these years, and we're making fundamental, massive decisions for these kids on sport. And I'm looking at it going, holy crap, what a mixture of stuff going on. Take that 14-year-old, start of the season, he was here. Perfect control, okay, good spatial awareness. Six months later, suddenly here, his wrist, 
is like six inches further from his shoulder than it was at the start of the season. He's, I don't know, a foot and a half above the planet compared to where he was. And you wonder why for a short period of time, his skill sucks. What happened to you? You were good, now you suck. Because no one's got any patience. And of course, you're going to use that to select him for the next year. In some parts of the country, they practice, they actually select their team for the next year in bloody March. When the kid is going through this massive growth period for September. Just like school. We did that. You wouldn't be doing history this semester because you failed the exam. And we haven't even taught you anything yet. See how it starts to get dictated by us? People, programs, places. The brain. <sighs> this is looking at the brain below the line, okay, from the top, where the bit closest to the black line is the front. Above the black line, we're looking at the brain from the right-hand side, okay? So the right hand of the diagram is the front of the brain. As we go from the yellows and greens to the indigos, it's the maturation of the brain, particularly this component, the prefrontal cortex. Anyone that's got teenagers will understand this. This is a very late developing part of the brain. They are hardwired, both hormonally as well as on the neural side, to stay in bed until noon on Saturdays. So try fighting that one. Ain't going to happen. They're nocturnal. Go figure. They don't like authority. They rebel. They have incredibly poor timekeeping. They don't tidy their rooms. This is all to do with the maturation of that central processing unit, the brain. Hardwired to do that. They're not miniature adults. Completely different animal. Here's a nine-year-old. You'll notice this is not a pristine soccer surface. There is no one else in sight. It's him with the ball. And the reason why I'm starting to pinpoint nine is because of where you are at the moment with your six-year-old. You have a very short window of time to start to ensure that you have had maximal one person with the implements for a few years here. And remember the, the start of the growth spurts? I showed you the girls, the boys. One glaring thing, girls grow earlier, which means you have less time with girls to develop the basics. Because once they get into the growth spurt, all hell is broken loose. The start of the growth spurt marks the end, biologically, of childhood. Don't waste these times. They are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years once in their life. 365 days each time to do the best possible thing for them because it's their lives, not ours. Nine years of age. Was he taught this? Did he learn it through playing? You'll see him point at the crossbar. At one point he even pulls his shoes, his, his pants up. And of course he finishes with a nice smile. You think as his brain develops with this skill that you can teach him tactics? I would think so. Don't have to teach the Pittsburgh defensive system to a bunch of six-year-olds. I'm not going to comprehend it for a start. Totally wasted anyway, when you should be concentrating on what can they do, each one of them, with the puck. Throw them the puck. Knock, myself, knock yourself out. Show me what you can do. Here's a tennis ball. Go home, play with that. Come back and show me what you can do with that tennis ball next week. What kind of play work or homework do you give them? <laughs> to the crossbar. Pulls his pants up. That comes about by incredible amounts of time on task, both structured, being given direction by an appropriate, knowledgeable adult, and being allowed to play in their own time, being encouraged to go home, and being excited to actually do that. Not sitting on a bench, watching, doing, 
kids want to do. That's why that previous uh, report I mentioned, the three, about team sports, kids would far rather play on a losing team than sit on the bench of a winning team. You've probably heard that phrase. Always amazes me with parents of netminders when it starts to get serious at about uh, 12, 13, 14, when they, you're starting to specialize into that particular area. And they all want them to be on a winning team. Well, how is a goalie going to get good on a winning team with a great defense and a puck that never comes down their end? You want to put them on the shittiest team. Totally random defense in front of them with shots coming at them everywhere because they need to have lots of shots. They need to build the experience of completely random shit coming at them. Not the meaningless ball ball, because I don't give a damn who wins at 10, 12, 14. It's meaningless. Except for the parents. Or maybe the coach. Kids get over that stuff. Okay. Here's some really important stuff for you, particularly again for your age group. First two decades of life, percentage change. This is without training, this is just what happens to people. If we brought a bunch of kids at age 11 into the room, fed them, let them go out and play every so often, took them to the bathroom, but just kept them here, okay? And watched them grow for about the next decade. Okay, first line. Probably heard of this one, aerobic power. Max more aerobic power. Okay, the maximum amount of oxygen you can take in, transport around the body, and utilize by whatever organ is required to use it, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the muscle. So you can see that it naturally changes rapidly through this period. But I just showed you a graph that gave you a clue as to why that's happening. Height. So VO2 is going up naturally because they're changing in size. Bigger lungs, bigger blood volume, bigger muscle mass. No wonder. Pretty simple, isn't it? VO2 is going up. Compared to this line, anaerobic capacity. This is that stuff like, you know, you're running for the bus and you cough up a lung after about 20 seconds of trying to run as fast as you can. Okay? Anaerobic capacity. Or this particular one, and this is blood lactate accumulation that physiologists often use as an indicator of how hard that particular anaerobic system has worked. But you can see immediately an age differential. You can see very clearly that children and youth are very aerobic compared to up here, of course, and the nature of the way the game of hockey is played, which is a power type sport, highly anaerobic, not designed by a physiologist, unfortunately, because you have to do this anaerobic work and then come and sit on a bench, which is not the type of thing we would design. That's why you see them doing all those type of active recoveries as seniors after the game, to get rid of some of the nasties. Not so much the blood lactate, but certainly the hydrogen ions and the ammonia. Part of the responsibility of that smelly hockey equipment comes through from the biochemistry of what's happening to these players. So, in other words, if I would address a bunch of six-year-olds in hockey gear, and you're all going, oh, wow, look at them, mini NHLers, they matching hat, uh, um, uh, helmets and gloves, they look exactly the same, and, and then you've got your, your eight-year-old, and then your 10, and 12, and 14, and 16, and all the way up to 24, and you ask them to rush down the ice, where everyone under the age of 12 was going to be producing energy very, very aerobically. Okay? To go up and back. I'm not talking about the first few stripes. The kids from about 14 through to 18 are kind of caught in the middle. Okay? Depending on how well developed they are, okay? Some will be a bit ahead of the curve compared to others because they grow at different rates. A bit more impetus from the anaerobic system, but really not until past puberty. Then you get to the late teens. They're a little bit more anaerobic than the guys below them. And then finally you get into the early 20s where you've got the mature, stable platform and they're doing it very, very anaerobically. So, even though you're watching them and you're thinking you're watching hockey, they're actually doing things very differently, which means you want to start to do different things with them. So understand that as well. Understand that muscle fiber type isn't even stabilized until well after puberty. So don't tell me you're looking at a sprinter versus an endurance kid before that. 